This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Wednesday, February 10th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show... The way to think about this, in my mind, is that it is safer to get the vaccine than to get the disease. The state's historically black university teams up with a top health official to address community concerns about the coronavirus vaccine. Then a ban-the-box criminal justice reform bill falls short in the Senate. Plus, after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, HUD awards Mississippi nearly $6 million to address homelessness. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippi's black residents are getting vaccinated at a disproportionately low rate compared to their white counterparts. State health officials and leaders within the black community are confronting the issue by addressing concerns of trust and access regarding the coronavirus vaccine. Dr. Stephanie Miles Richardson is an associate dean of public health at the Morehouse School of Medicine. During a virtual town hall event last night hosted by Jackson State University, she said for many in the community, the question boils down to trust. I believe the the conversation is about trust and trustworthiness. Uh, Because I I think that we're clear that COVID is not an option. It's nothing to play with. It disproportionately impacts our communities. So why are we then having a conversation around hesitancy? It's not hesitancy, it's trust. Do we trust the science? Do we trust the scientists? Do we trust the messengers? And I think that my line sister called me yesterday because she trusts me because I've proven myself trustworthy. So I think that what we have to do is acknowledge the fact that history through the federal government and others has has proven not to be trustworthy. So then it becomes difficult to simply trust. But, But I think the option is clear because it's COVID or the vaccine. Distrust in the government regarding matters of public health have deep roots, most notably the Tuskegee experiment of the 20th century. Dr. George Benjamin, executive director of the American Public Health Association, says the difference now is that health leaders are trying to offer treatment. It was a study of lack of treatment. Um, In that case, they did not treat those gentlemen. They followed them along to study the natural history which of course became immoral because treatment became available. In this case, we're trying to offer treatment to people, which I think is a very different situation. Clearly, we know the natural history is if you don't get vaccinated. And in that case, if you get infected, people of color are much more likely to get sicker or die sooner, mostly not because of genes, that's, that, it's because of propensity of chronic diseases and or the fact that we're out working. We have jobs that put us at greater risk. So we're bus drivers. We're cashiers. We're working in grocery stores. We're working in hotels. We're out and about. So therefore, a disease in which you get from another person, you're much more likely to get infected. And if you have chronic diseases, you're much more likely to get severely ill and, of course, die. The vaccine clearly prevents all the ones that have been treated, you know, tested so far, and the two that have been approved in the United States, both totally prevent severe disease and death. And so the way to think about this, in my mind, is that it is safer to get the vaccine than to get the disease. Dr. Benjamin also says while the vaccines were produced quickly, no steps in the research process were skipped. State health officials recognize there are barriers that need to be negotiated to better reach the state's black community. State health officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs participated in last night's event and addressed those obstacles. What we've learned is where the barriers are. And so what we have to do is we need to learn to destroy the barriers. We need to lower them. We need to overcome them. 
and we need to make sure that opportunities are available for black Mississippians to get the vaccine. Um, early on, from day one, we did engage aggressively with our community health center partners, and they've been fantastic. Of the vaccine that we've given to community health centers, 71% have gone to black Mississippians, compared to 19% for the total effort, right? That's a big difference. So finding effective partners is gonna be huge. Lowering barriers. We have seen that only about 18% of folks going to the drive throughs are black. We've seen that that's been a big barrier, but we've had a great partnership working with different churches and some of the Baptist churches on the coast have done a phenomenal thing. They've set up a team to help people who don't have internet access to get people signed up and they get a list. And so I'll, 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 I'll let folks know as soon as I can that appointments are available and they're sitting there ready to put them in. Having these sort of innovative approaches have been fantastic, but that's not going to be enough. We got to find other ways. So um, expect for to see more and more specialized vaccination efforts, drive-throughs, mass events. They're going to be especially targeted for for underserved communities, rural communities, or black communities especially. So we got we got a long way to go, but um, as a state, we're committed to it. Our, we have fantastic partners, and just know that we have an entire division that's devoted entirely to health equity for COVID. And they've been actively involved since the second week of the pandemic. Um, not that it's OK. We're not where we want to be, but we're not giving up. Mississippi's health officer, Dr. Thomas Dobbs. Coming up, a ban the box criminal justice reform bill falls short in the Senate. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. A criminal justice reform bill designed to help former inmates secure employment is facing challenges in the state legislature. Known as the Ban the Box Bill, it would prohibit questions about criminal convictions on applications for state jobs. Senator John Horn, a Democrat from Jackson, says the question is a barrier to those rehabilitated and trying to enter the workforce. He explains more with our Ashley Norwood. It uh, would restrict public employers from being able to ask a question on the front end as to whether a person has a criminal history. Uh, The question can be asked, but uh, only after the the employer has agreed to do a face-to-face interview, essentially, uh, with that prospective applicant. And there's a specific job that they're being interviewed for. I know this bill came up last year as well. Uh, talk to me about the importance of it and why bring it back in this session. Well, you know, we're, we have a problem with getting people in the workforce. We have a problem uh, when folks who have had uh, trouble in, in their past, that they have a criminal history uh, of not being able to get past the front door. And uh, this bill would have allowed them to at least get past the preliminary activities and actions of of seeking employment to the point where they had a serious interview. And at that point, the employer can ask the question and do a background check. The question did come up on the floor, you know, is this a waste of time? What are your thoughts there? Well, I don't think it's a waste of time. I I think that uh, it allows uh, potential employees to have a credible shot at being able to be employed. Uh, a lot of times, uh, people who, who have had a criminal history, uh, the, the moment they check the box, uh, do you have a, a, a felony in your background, that file uh, goes into the trash can. So we're, we're just trying to give people an opportunity to get gainful employment and to be able to uh, explain themselves and, and, uh, and maybe sell themselves. Uh, and at the, the point where they seem, uh, the employer seems to be serious, uh, in possibly hiring this person or think that they're at least uh, worthy of, of a further interview, then uh, at that point they can check into the criminal history and then make a judgment from there. Uh, but but um, just uh, eliminating people you know, before they can get through the front door uh, doesn't do anybody any good. 
Do we see this in other states uh, feel like this? Yeah, we, uh, over 30 states have uh, been involved with, with this, this uh, program and have passed similar legislation, uh, and we haven't seen any major hiccups uh, with regard to that. Uh, and Mississippi uh, has a, a, a workforce problem. We have jobs that are, that are going on field, and we just thought that this would be an opportunity to give, give folks a shot uh, at uh, being able to be gainfully employed uh, and not being eliminated uh, at the very front door. Senator John Horn of Jackson. Opponents of the bill, like Republican Joey, uh, Joey Fillingane, say state agencies need safeguards in place during the initial stages of the application process. He says questions of criminal history should be asked on the front end. Well, my concern is that especially in certain areas of state government, it may be sensitive to um, drugs things of that nature. So, for instance, all of our employees at MDOC, our parole officers that work for the Department of Parole, all of those types of issues. If you have a criminal background, especially in drugs, for instance, we've already had contraband issues of drugs coming into our prison system and causing all sorts of problems for the guards and for the inmates as well. We just want to make sure that the people that we hire to come into the system don't have a propensity to be doing those sorts of things. And I think one of the obvious ways you can check that is by making sure they don't have a criminal past that would show that they had drug-related um, cr- convictions, crimes, possession, cell-type charges. And if you're not even going to ask that question on the front end, I don't understand. That makes no sense to me. You would want to know those sorts of things. I don't know the proponents say, well, they can come in, you can interview them and ask those questions, but why put them through the embarrassment of having to be turned down and rejected if you know on the front end that if they have that, that they're not going to be eligible for these positions? So I think it's an unnecessary step, in my opinion. Do you understand the concern of some senators who may say, you know, that, that some people, I guess, have been discriminated against because of a past felony in, in situations of employment? Well, I think some people have not had as many opportunities because of past poor decisions that they've made in their life, certainly. And uh, no one forced anyone to make those decisions, uh, so I don't view it as discrimination at all. I view it as we all have opportunities, we all have choices we have to make, and none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But if you've made a mistake that led you to selling drugs, for instance, we don't need you working at the Department of Corrections selling drugs to inmates. That's the point I was trying to get across on the floor debate today. So right now it's on the motion to be reconsidered. So does that mean it has to come up within a certain couple of days? Yeah, I think Friday is the deadline to take up any motions to reconsider and to dispose of them one way or the other. They can either be tabled or if enough people change their mind on the bill, they can vote to reconsider the vote and then have a revote basically to pass it as opposed to killing it. Republican Joey Fillingane of Sumrall with our Ashley Norwood. Coming up after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, HUD awards Mississippi nearly $6 million to address homelessness. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and this is a Southern Remedy Health Minute. Doctor, are there any treatments for a UTI other than an antibiotic? Yeah, so a urinary tract infection is a common thing in people. Uh, Women tend to get them more than men because what we think is that the urethra is shorter. So there's a shorter distance from the outside where you have bacteria uh, that can travel back up the urethra into the bladder. Now, it can go higher than that. The danger with an untreated urinary tract infection is that it can track all the way up to the kidneys, and that's a much more serious infection we call pyelonephritis. So a lot of people will ask, well, I don't want to take antibiotics. I don't want to, you know, run the risk of doing that or changing. I, they either they have bad uh, side effects with antibiotics or they have, uh, you know, different uh, uh, whatever the reason. Um, so you can early on try to prevent them with changing the acidity of the urine. Uh, certainly, cranberry juice has been used. Other things have been used to sort of treat the symptoms like peridium. Um, but uh, and, and there is some evidence that they help to. Um, to decrease the risk of it, 
Once you get that infection, though, uh, for most people, now it, you'll you'll clear it out, but you do run the risk of that not clearing out if you don't take an appropriate antibiotic. Um, if you do take an antibiotic, I'm a big proponent of doing a culture. In other words, you take some of the urine and and look <laughs> and see what bacteria is growing out so you can be as specific as possible with an antibiotic. A lot of people will uh -huh. do what we call an empiric therapy, which is okay, but um, as close, as narrow as you can get, then you're going to run less of a risk with having multiple drug resistances to different bacteria. But to help, if you have frequent ones, I would, you know, cranberry juice is fine, uh, you know, as long as you're not, uh, you know, at risk for increased sugar, like with uh, diabetes. For more health tips and medical information, listen to Southern Remedy each weekday morning at 11 on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Mississippi's continuum of care, continuums of care are receiving over $5.5 million from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to renew support for 32 local homeless assistance programs. COCs use funding to provide a variety of interventions designed to assist individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Hannah Mahari is with the Mississippi Balance of State, a COC responsible for programs in 71 of the state's 82 counties. She shares more about the function of COCs and the programming funded through HUD. We are a structure or coalition of agencies that are directly funded for or support to housing homeless individuals. So the agencies that are directly funded from the continuum of care are agencies that are responsible for housing homeless individuals in our area. Um, and then all of the other supportive services that would go along with that. So our coalition is comprised of like over 100, 150 agencies across our coverage area. Each continuum of care has a different coverage area defined by HUD. So this is all supported by and planned out by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Through our continuum of care, we're doing direct street outreach. So that means we actually go and find homeless individuals where they are because the but ultimately, to connect our homeless population to housing, we have to go find them where they are. We have to meet them where they are. So we actually have street outreach teams that go out every single week, every single day, and go find homeless individuals where they're staying. And we have a very specific definition of homelessness, too, that we try to um, make very clear, that under continuum of care, our definition means a literal homelessness. It means they are staying in a place not meant for human habitation. HUD has granted nearly $6 million to Mississippi mm -hmm. for 32 projects. Now, these are renewed projects. Is that correct? They're not new, right. but renewed. That's exactly right. Um, we were, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we were, all of our agencies were actually renewed. Typically, each year, there would be a competition process. So we'd have new applicants or we'd have renewal agencies that submit an application for renewal and would go through a competition cycle. The great thing that HUD has done this year, since we've had such a difficult year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, is renew all of our agencies that were funded in 2019 again for 2020, which has been a true blessing for us because it means we get to continue our services. Um, I want to brag on the agencies that are in our continuum of care because we know all the difficulties that we've all Mississippians have experienced due to the pandemic, but especially our homeless community, um, since they are very marginalized and kind of live on the fringes of society, um, they were pushed further out into the fringes due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I want to brag on our housing agencies because we were still able to house people, even during a pandemic where landlords weren't leasing, where utility companies weren't open for us to create new accounts. 
where we couldn't do as much street outreach as we we were used to because of the, um, you know, face-to-face contact and social distancing. So the fact that we were able to continue housing people that were living in literal homelessness in 2020 during a pandemic was wonderful. How many of the 32 projects uh, are in the rural area, your area of Mississippi? About tw- um, We have about 12 or 13 programs that are being funded. We have a couple of agencies that have multiple programs, um, but we have 12 to 13 projects or programs that are being funded. You said that you go out looking for the homeless that um, to mm-hmm. identify those who literally are living in their trucks or under a bridge, as you mentioned. How... Mm-hmm. What are you finding? Are there? I mean, are you seeing homeless people? Every time you go out, are you identifying homeless people? And and how many are there in your area, in the mm-hmm. rural area of the state? So in the rural area, um, it's kind of uh, the same same situation you would find in a more urban area. Our homeless population are going to be where the most resources are. So our three largest populations of homelessness in my coverage area is the Tupelo Tupelo area, Meridian area, and Hattiesburg area. So we have a larger number of homelessness in those areas because there's more resources, they're larger communities. Um, And it's really different across the region. It also depends on what causes homelessness in that area because that's a different reason too. Um, In some communities, the the homeless population are comprised of people who are from that community. So that means that either there's been an economic downturn or the housing has become very expensive. So people from that area are losing housing and become homeless in that area. Other communities, it's very transient. So you'll have people that are coming from outside of the state even or outside of the community and becoming homeless or coming through that community and are homeless. So it just depends on the area that you're in and the culture of the area. How many homeless people are you sheltering, providing housing for at any given time? That's difficult to say because it's a process. Um, I will say it's a process. Like each, the housing process itself is hard to determine. We try to house everybody that we meet but within 30 days. But a lot of that has to do with the housing process. How long can we get their documentation to get, like, all their documentation together? How long does it take to get the lease signed? How long does it take to get all the utility and deposits paid? Um, how long does it take to actually move that person into into housing, like, actually physically move them into housing? So the housing process is different um, for each client because each client has specific needs. But I, it's, I know for a fact that... One of our programs in a single month could house, like across our balance of state area, could house 25 to 30 people. Can people find out more about your organization and what you do? Do you have a website? Sure. It's, it's, it's www.msbos.org. So it's Mississippi Balance of State.org. So msbos.org. Hannah Meharry is the director of Mississippi Balance of State Continuum of Care, and I thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Each year, HUD serves more than one million people through emergency shelter, transitional, and permanent housing programs. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This 